Good afternoon. This is Stephen Jones coming to you again. I just got back last night from our trip. Uh, I was gone for about 12 days to the south, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas and Missouri. And uh, finally just got back with my wife last night. So I wanted to give you an update here of what was accomplished uh, in, uh, in this trip other than uh, having a good time of fellowship with uh, Robbie Yates and uh, Rick Lynham. We had a great time. You may have seen some of the pictures that I posted earlier. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this, this is for, uh, for our friends from Europe. If you uh, want to have some coffee and a stein, It almost seems blasphemous, doesn't it? Coffee in a Stein? Well, anyway, <clears throat> um, when, when I got down to North Mississippi, um, Rick Lynham and Robbie uh, took me up into, uh, into Memphis and uh, we went up the, uh, to the lookout at the top of the Great Pyramid which used to be a stadium. Now the Great Pyramid Stadium in Memphis is right along the Nile, I mean the Mississippi River. And uh, uh, it used to be a, a pyramid stadium. And in fact, when we lived there, in fact, when we moved there in November, uh, November 29 of 1987, they were building that structure at that time. And they completed it within the two year period when, uh, when we lived there. We lived there for just a little over two years. But of course, stadiums get old after uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, it seems that they're, they're not good anymore. And so they have to rebuild or sell the old building. Well, this one happened to be sold to a Bass Pro shop. And so now the whole floor of that, of that area is is all de dedicated to selling uh, sporting equipment, and uh, it's a beautiful place. It's almost like a like a park in there because they have plenty of space. But anyway, they bought it some years ago, and uh, uh, at the top of the pyramid, which we we would see as the capstone of the pyramid, uh, they put in a restaurant, and that's a beautiful place too, and has great food. Some of the best I've ever eaten, right up there. And they even have uh, uh, a huge aquarium up there. And I uh, can only imagine the weight of the water in that aquarium. Some very large fish up there and everything. But this is way up at the top and uh, is a very, uh, uh, very beautiful place up there where you can uh, take a look out and see the city. Uh, the city of Memphis, or as I like to call it, Egypt. You can look out over the land of Egypt and and see the the uh, what would be the the Nile River there next to it. And um, anyway, the whole thing was was very prophetic. We went up there on the evening of the night of the ninth of May which by Hebrew time, of course, is the beginning of the 10th of May. Well, the 10th of May happens to be the 40th day from the wave sheep offering on, on April 1st. Most people would call it Easter. And so the 40th day after the wave sheaf or the 40th day after Easter is what? Ascension day. Well, we ascended and we ascended into the capstone of the Great Pyramid, which obviously uh, represents Christ. If you know the story of the building of the Great Pyramid, it was intentionally built 286.1 uh, pyramid inches off center. And so when it came time to put the, uh, the capstone on it, it didn't fit. And so as scripture puts it prophetically, um, the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And of course, Jesus applied that to himself in, uh, uh, in the book of Matthew. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he was rejected 
just as the capstone on the pyramid was rejected. Well, the uh, the capstone uh, sits at the, uh, it's actually the 204th layer of stone uh, in the old Great Pyramid in Egypt. Uh, from the base up to the king's chamber is 50 layers. It's the 50th uh, layer. And then there's 153 layers on top of that, which of course, these are all very prophetic numbers. You know, the 50 speaks of Jubilee uh, to the king's chamber. And then resting on top of that is 153 layers of rock which uh, represents the sons of God. These are all uh, very biblical numbers, and uh, the Great Pyramid has a revelation in it that ties very closely in to the, the Bible. Now, what were we doing up there? Well, we were in the 204th uh, layer, as it were, the capstone, and it was an ascension. When you connect it to an ascension, then you have to ask yourself, okay, what happened when Jesus ascended on the 40th day? Well, he ascended to the throne. He ascended to, um, to his place of, uh, of ministry for, uh, for the next 2,000 years, which is essentially uh, where he makes intercession for the people. And uh, during this time of the uh, of the age of Pentecost or the age of the church as most people would call it it's actually an age of Pentecost because there's really three churches there's a Passover church from Moses to Christ there's a Pentecost church from Acts chapter 2 until recently and now we are transitioning into a tabernacles church and each of these uh, transitions uh, brings us into a higher understanding of truth and revelation and experience with God. Things become clearer as well. So anyway, what was the purpose? Uh, why were we brought up there from a prophetic standpoint? Well, the uh, it gave us an overview of Egypt, that is Memphis. Uh, Memphis's sister city is Memphis, Egypt. And when we lived there way back 30 years ago, we understood that we were at that time in an Egyptian bondage, uh, and that had to that had to do with completely different things from this time. But we went from bondage in the late 1980s to a, an ascension here. Very interesting. Now, uh, what is the purpose of the ascension? That is the that is the issue. Well. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 19, there is a prophecy about the Great Pyramid. And uh, it comes in the context of a general prophecy about Egypt. In fact, the whole chapter uh, of Isaiah 19 is the oracle concerning Egypt. And uh, there is judgment on Egypt, but at the same time, in fact, even Memphis is even mentioned in verse 13, uh, but in verses 19 and 20, there is a prophecy uh, that says, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. And it will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Those two verses, if you take the numeric value of each of their letters and add them all together, the numeric value of those two verses is 5,449, 5449. That just happens to be the height of the pyramid in its own, with, by using its own internal measurement called the pyramid inch. It's almost exactly like our modern inches uh, that we use in America. The Great Pyramid is 5,449 pyramid inches high. And the numeric value of the one passage in the Bible which mentions the Great Pyramid, the altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, is exactly 5,449. 
that alone tells you what the prophet was talking about. And uh, the Great Pyramid is on the border between Upper and Lower Egypt. And it, right on the border, and it's right in the midst of the land of Egypt. That is, it's, it's not on an outer border. It's, in, it's on an internal border that separates the Lower Egypt, which is the Delta area, and the Upper Egypt, which actually goes south quite a ways. And so Isaiah says that there is to be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. He's actually using uh, uh, terminology as they do in Hebrew so often, where it's a parallelism. Uh, he's not talking about two different objects or two different uh, structures. He's talking about the same structure. It is both at the border and in the midst of the land of Egypt. And that describes the Great Pyramid perfectly. It is an altar to the Lord. That's why it is prophetic. That's why the stone that the builders rejected is Christ, but it's also uh, the capstone on the Great Pyramid. Because the head of a corner is actually um, a four-sided figure uh, structure with a capstone on the top. And that would be uh, uh, that would be the prophecy. Now, <clears throat> what does this mean then? Why did we actually go up there? Well, I believe that we went up there to observe the land of Egypt, as it were, and to bear witness to what God was doing with Egypt. Uh, so this would have reference to the actual land of Egypt in the Middle East, I believe. But more than that, Egypt is uh, also a biblical metaphor for the world. Uh, and so when God took, took uh, Israel out of Egypt, he was, he was really prophesying of the world coming out or the, the church coming out of the world uh, to form a new nation, to form uh, a new way of life kingdom living as opposed to Egyptian uh, fleshly living. And so for that reason, uh, we all uh, we all went up there and uh, it also has to do with inheritance. I want to mention inheritance. Uh, when Jesus went up and ascended to heaven, he essentially was functioning from his inheritance. So it's, uh, it's interesting that without realizing it, um, I ordered some uh, venison up there, which, of course, reminds us of Jacob and Esau when the inheritance, uh, when the, the, uh, the blessing was going to be passed down, uh, supposedly to Esau, uh, Isaac told him to go and fetch some venison first. So venison has to do with that story, and it has to do with with this uh, dominion mandate that was being passed down. And of course, uh, the rest of the story uh, isn't fully relevant to us here because uh, uh, that was a whole different context. But, uh, and yet it is. So anyway, so I ordered the elk, the elk. Now, I asked the waitress, you know, if, if uh, elk was just uh, a deer on steroids, and uh, she didn't think so. And so anyway, uh, we had, I had elk and it was uh, really, really good. In fact, all the food there was just excellent. It was heavenly. And uh, so anyway, I, I believe that this has to do with marking a time frame here this year where perhaps we will be exercising the authority uh, we'll be receiving a dominion mandate. Um, we'll have to see how this plays out in the rest of the year to see exactly how this will apply uh, in practice. But it's a good sign anyway. It's a very good sign. And we were able to look out over the city and, uh, uh, and see what's going on. Now, just one more thing I want to say. I want to read the, the, some a little bit further down in Isaiah 19. 
We already read verses 19 and 20, but here in verse 23 to 25 is the ultimate result of this prophecy in Isaiah 19. And here it says, in that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is, is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Hmm. Interesting. There's, gonna, there's a threesome here. Uh, <clears throat> We think of Assyria as being the oppressor of the Israelites because the Assyrians came down and took the northern house of Israel, the ten tribes, uh, to Assyria, and of course they never returned, nor were they ever known as Jews. They were Israelites, not Jews. And so uh, the Assyrians accomplished that much judgment, and as you know, 120 years later, the Babylonians overthrew Assyria and then came down and took Judah to Babylon. That was a separate captivity. It was a different captivity. And, um, and so Assyria has, is traditionally a, a, uh, a metaphor for an oppressor, an oppressor or a divine judgment. But it's the same thing with Egypt because Egypt was also an oppressor uh, in an earlier time prior to Moses. Moses left or led Israel out of Egypt, but uh, Assyria, uh, the people never came back to the land from the land of Assyria. So it's interesting that Israel, Assyria, and Egypt would form a, a an alliance, if you will, and the terminology actually brings them into a position where there are kingdom nations. And isn't it interesting that it's Egypt, my people. Blessed is Egypt, my people. So, you know, you ask about uh, who are God's people or who are God's chosen people. And uh, everybody says Israel or the Jews or somebody like that. Some say the church. Well, here, Egypt is my people. And so I believe that the work that we were called to do, essentially, or observe what God is doing from the top of the Great Pyramid was to see and bear witness to what God is doing to make Memphis and make Egypt my people. So I believe that God is uh, in the process of fulfilling his new covenant vow where he will make us his people and he will be our God. And that is God's oath or vow or promise uh, of the new covenant because the new covenant is based upon the promises of God not upon the promises of men, like the Old Covenant. So that is essentially, I believe, what was accomplished uh, in Memphis, at least on the first stop uh, that I had on this particular trip. God bless.